second. Okay. Hey, Gavin. How's it going? Good. How do you like my new outfit? I think it's great. I think it's great. <laughs> Soon as one of these days, we'll hold this in VR. Yeah. You know, I just checked out your app, um, Altface VR. Pretty awesome app. Uh, this is the first time I actually really actually paid attention to VR. I got this many months ago, try to do uh, meditation with this. Uh -huh. Never really picked up, but right now, believe it or not, because of COVID-19, yep. I am playing more and more in the VR space. I picked up games. Um, I really like this game called the um, Smash Beats. Yeah, yeah. Or is it Beat Saber? Yeah, be saver. Yeah, that's a good yeah, idea. I, I, I'm, I'm actually was sweating using using my I know. I know it's fun. You get a little bit of a workout. <laughs> and also, I would never expect myself to talk to a gamer. Mm -hmm. um, I like your headset, by the way. I know. I was like, exactly it's inappropriate. I'm gonna yeah. get one. I know. They're good. It's that's the thing is everybody's uh, leaning on gaming tech when everybody's working remotely here. Yeah, and and this is the first time I, I started to feel like there's like a whole set of new language that I need to pick up. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, quite a few 3D printing people uh, that I already know who are like 3D designers. Um, they're using exactly the same headphone that you're using, and they yeah. do 3D printing design at the same time mm -hmm. does game design. Yeah, it was like. First of all, you know, I am a very serious person. <laughs> In general, I don't play games. It's never, you know, part of me. Um, so that side, that side of the world, you know, is very foreign to me. Mm. Um, I'm kind of glad that I met you because you ventured into bioprinting because you did some work with Prelis Biologic. Yeah. Because of that, I got to know you. And because of that, I started to realize that you know, actually a lot of developers in the gaming industry mm. can really do a lot in the 3D printing space. Um, yeah, I think before so. Before we go like more and more in depth with that perspective, like kind of curious about your life story. So you want to share with us like, you know, how you became a game gamer, sure. developing and then like move on to doing stuff for Prelis. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so I was born and raised in Hawaii and grew up out there. Um, and I always, um, I loved kind of digital art and that was one of my favorite things kind of like in high school. And yeah. Like the way in the background over there. Yeah, I know that's, I get, get some crazy backgrounds. Yeah. That's one of my favorite artists. It's uh, Android oh. Jones. That's a lot of kind of burning man art. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, and you know what, I actually got a new 3d print right back there. That, uh, that is my, where I grew up in Hawaii. That is a crater called diamond head and I got a 3d nice. print on the wall. Nice. So. Just print it? That's 3d yeah. printed. Yeah, oh, it's sandstone. Oh. It's cool. Maybe I'll show you afterwards. Yes. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I always loved that. And so uh, did a bunch of work kind of throughout high school and kind of like VFX, uh, you know, kind of game programming stuff. And so when I went to college, I knew I was going to do that. And I got a degree in game design uh, and game programming at USC. Um, but the thing that I realized when I was sort of graduating was like, I loved the technology uh, and the design principles and all that kind of stuff. But I just wasn't really interested in kind of using it for entertainment. You know, I wanted to kind of find a way to use it uh, for, for more sort of like impact on sort of things that I cared about. Yeah. And so started off working uh, at Disney. Uh, we kind of uh, created a new department to try to figure out how to kind of reinvent educational games for kids. Uh, and that worked really well. We made a bunch of kind of cool games. We worked with their MMOs. And uh, we, one of the things that we were trying to do was kind of hide the learning inside the game so the kid wouldn't tell. Um, and uh, so that learning, was is, learning is associated with pain. Well, that's the thing. There's like a specific like grade level, like a specific age range. I forget exactly what it is. I don't know, maybe like fifth through eighth or something like that, where they won't touch it if it seems educational, you know. And so we uh, we wanted to make sure that we could hit that. Uh, and so that was great. And then, you know, I've done, you know, just over the years, I've always just tried to find different places where I can try to leverage, you know, this gaming technology, this sort of 3D technology, this VFX technology. Um, but kind of in like the furthest flung, you know, spaces from where that started, you know, right? And so I worked with Matterport for a number of years, kind of doing like 3D house reconstruction. Um, I, uh, I don't know, years, but at least a year. Uh, I worked, and then so I founded uh, Altspace VR. Uh, yeah. So that was a social virtual reality company that you mentioned a little bit there. Uh, so that's all about, you know, basically feeling like you're in the same place uh, with somebody else or with a large group of people, uh, even if you're not physically present. Uh, Which is perfect right now. I know, right? Isn't that funny? 
Yeah. And so, I, was, I was searching, uh, fr- uh, you know, I was searching for people, but I couldn't find anyone on the space when I was testing it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it's interesting, cause, right? It's still early. It's still, um, you know, it's still kind of in development. So, um, you know, long story short, we, we sold that to Microsoft. Uh, so they're, yeah. uh, they're developing that. And then some of the other folks spun off and did Mozilla Hubs, uh, which is another great platform that works a little bit better if people, uh, like if you're just like, we need to get this meeting that we normally would have um, in person into VR because that works across PC, Mac, um, all that kind of stuff. We used to have a Mac client before we sold to Microsoft, but that's a different story. Um, that's but, a good story. A good story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a good story. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's been great. You know, I, um, this last, you know, after I left Altspace, I started kind of looking around for different projects. One of the things I realized is I was like, you know, I think I can have an impact with this technology virtually, but I was like, how do I bring these skills that I have closer and closer to the real world? You know, so I started looking at robotics and self-driving cars and sensor visualization, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then I uh, started talking to Melanie and I've always, you know, for the last maybe decade or so, I've had kind of a interest in sort of hobbyist interest in biology and synthetic biology. And uh, a SynBio project was actually the thing that originally, like I drove up to the Bay to sort of check out. And so, um, you know, when I heard what she was looking on and I realized that I thought I could help with some of the uh, structure design, I was like, oh, this sounds like, uh, sounds like a lot of fun. So, um, but yeah, so that's kind of how I got here. You know, I originally biology, I, um, I got kind of turned off from biology in like high school, just kind of the way they taught it was all memorization, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but after eventually I picked up, it was a book on like Evo Devo, it was like, uh, evolutionary development and it, like I started looking at it from like an engineering lens and mm-hmm. then that caught my attention and I just kind of started diving into it and trying to learn about it. So. I like to have a link up that book. I want to, I'm curious. Yeah, you know. it's, it's yeah. funny. I looked it up just before we talked. It's called Endless Forms Most Beautiful. Um, and the thing that made me laugh about that is that it's written by somebody named Sean Carroll um, who, uh, and uh, but uh, it's not the same Sean Carroll, who's the physicist Sean Carroll, who's also one of my favorite scientists. So I guess I guess the name's got a got a scientific background to it. But but yeah, that's a that's a good one there. So let's go back a little bit. You met Melanie. How did you guys surf together? Like, was I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming. Um, um, you know, we run kind of in similar social circles in San Francisco. Um, you know, it's kind of intersection of tech, uh, kind of Burning Man, like all that kind of stuff. Um, and I don't actually know if she's ever been to the barn, but, uh, but yeah, so we have a bunch of mutual friends and we were just chatting in the back of a car. I think she was giving me a ride somewhere at one point in time about the things that she was working on. Yeah. Yeah, So tell me a little bit more about this tissue. It's called tissue workshop, right? Or what is it called? Yeah. So that was the first project that we did together is, um, called tissue workshop. And so, uh, it's basically a, um, so it's a cloud service that you can go to. And it looks kind of like what you would expect um, from, you know, very, very lightweight uh, kind of CAD software. So it's got like a 3D viewport, you can, you know, move stuff around. And then the important thing is that you've got a bunch of dials on the side. And so the idea is, okay, I need a a specific type of tissue scaffold that we're going to print on a a printer and then we're going to seed it with cells. Uh, But we need that scaffold to have a bunch of like very specific properties, right? Like we might want it to have Uh, sort of tubes, you know, maybe they're simulating vasculature that are going through that have a certain diameter, that have a certain wall thickness configured to our printer. Um, We might want like a bunch of different layers of them with a certain density, a certain size, right? So you can dial all those parameters on the side uh, and that'll sort of live show you what that scaffold's gonna look like in the viewport. And then we have a bunch of algorithms on the back end. Uh, It's rendering all this stuff server side, which is kind of cool because we can upgrade this pretty effortlessly. Um, And then it will basically serve you up uh, a file there that's optimized for printing, right? So it's, you know, it's uh, manifold, it's got all the right structures and struts and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so yeah, it's basically an online tool for customizing scaffolds uh, that you can print on these printers to, to see the cells. Uh, and if I get you the bio well, service wrong, you, you, you let me know because I'm, I'm trying to learn as fast as I can. Well, that's what I'm curious about because you're definitely venturing into a very unknown territory here. Yeah. And yeah. so I assume that you and Melly kind of worked this out very closely to figure out stuff to make it work. Yeah. Um, what were some of the challenges that you felt like mm. that was the hardest part of this project? Well, you know, let's see, I think, you know, one of the things that was definitely a challenge was, um, you know, I, you know, I'm sure somebody can find something that's similar, but 
this isn't really something that's done very often where you've got, yeah. um, it was a pretty kind of greenfield thing where it's like, okay, we want to render this. The, the real question was like, how do we um, give this live updating viewport, right? Because I knew that one of the things that's really interesting, so the, this tool is kind of like a generative design tool, right? Like you customize a small set of parameters and it's going to give you something kind of complicated. And with these tools, rapid feedback is really useful because it lets you sort of explore that space. It lets you sort of see structures uh, and designs that you never would have sort of thought of before. Um, and so that iteration cycle of I'm sending parameters to the server, server generating the structure, it's sending it back to me and I get to see it. Uh, yeah. Getting that loop time fast was probably the biggest challenge and figuring out that architecture from like a technical standpoint. So you brought up a really interesting topic, which is generative design, which is a topic I started to learn about last year. Um, so are you saying that this tool right now is free for people to use online? <laughs> uh, it is free uh, to use for uh, basically like two total structure downloads. Um, so if you sign up, uh, you basically get like a few week uh, trial and you're allowed to download two structures on that and then pass that. Uh, you can pay for a subscription and sort of buy uh, structures. But it has a generative design component. Exactly, yeah. You want to you wanna just elaborate a little bit more what generative design, because not everybody know what that is. Yeah, so there's a bunch of different definitions for it, but I think the way that I think about it is um, that there's a very large ratio uh, between the amount of kind of like information you're putting into a design tool to the amount of information that you're getting out, right? So like... With this example, we're sending it maybe 10 parameters, right? Like, like two diameters or like angle between them, like a few different, you know, it's like a tiny, tiny, tiny file. And then the thing that you're getting back is like, you know, maybe a hundred megabytes, right? And so it's this way that you can um, basically have a machine do a lot of the design work for you um, with sort of like the nicest possible human interface where you're just telling it like the bare minimum things that are required uh, for the machine to figure out the rest. And so there's a bunch of different implementation uh, details for how you could do that, right? Like you can do that with, um, you know, a pretty straightforward sort of algorithmic approach. Um, you can use different types of machine learning in order to generate that. There's GANs, there's all sorts of things. Uh, but the basic idea is, yeah, I want to uh, provide a little bit of sort of user input, user control, and have a sort of elaborate uh, design come out of this that might have taken me a really long time to do by hand. Well, to have this kind of generative design process, you may need a lot of pre-existing data to figure out. Potentially, yeah. I think, you know, there's a bunch of different, it depends on the techniques that you're using. If you're going with an MLM route, you're gonna need a lot, uh, a lot more data. Uh, but, but sort of conceptually, even with a route where you're, you're more doing it with like a procedural network, which is sort of what we're doing in this case, um, the, the places where those, where that data is important is to get a sort of, uh, sometimes qualitative, sometimes quantitative sense of what these scaffolds need to look like, right? Like it's really hard to build this without looking at a bunch of scans of different tissues or knowing the diameters of these different, uh, you know, vessels and all that kind of stuff. Um, so sort of uh, collecting that information, building an intuition, sort of getting sort of reasonable ranges for these things, you know, that are sort of biologic. Uh, that is, is kind of the way that, that, that getting that data is important right now. Yeah, so you mentioned that, you know, this is a somewhat of a simplified CAT software. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm assuming that there are a lot of other things that will be critical for a successful biofabrication, like the chemical environment, and then what gravity is going to do to these, you know, supposedly soft materials. Um, you know, all these physical aspects of things are not yet incorporated in this particular design yet. This yeah. Very yeah, so one, that's one of the, the, the neat things about generative design is that, uh, and at least the way that we're doing it, which is sort of like a procedural network approach, is that it's very easy to go back and sort of tweak the algorithm later. Um, so with a lot of this stuff, it's iterative, right? So it's like, okay, let's produce a bunch of designs, let's test them, let's see which ones the cell's like, uh, and then we can feed that back through, right? And so uh, what the cell's like, or even, you know, right, does it stand up, does it, you know, collapse underweight, you know, all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, uh, having that really tight iteration loop uh, and the ability to basically like generate a lot. So like one of the things that's nice is we have some randomization components in there, right? So like with a given set of parameters, 
you could actually create hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of structures, right? And so with that, then you can test those and see, you know, how those work. That's hundreds and thousands of them, Gavin. Potentially, yeah, right? <laughs> and then I hand it off to the, you know, the, <laughs> the people who have to print it and test it and put cells into it. But, you know, from a software perspective, we can definitely do so it. Are you, are you still going to be continuing with Prelis on this particular project in the near future? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm actively working with them right now uh, on a couple uh, of continuing tissue workshop and a couple other projects. Um, yeah, so it's it's been a fruitful relationship. And uh, yeah. you know, just based on the story that we're talking about your journey, it, it almost feels like when you were much younger, you were very much living in the virtual space, <laughs> but now slowly moving into the physical space. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's fun. You know, I think it's um, yeah, definitely. I think that there's a there's just a desire, especially like, you know, if you're trying to have impact, it's a, it's a little bit more direct when it's in the physical space. And then it's also, um, I don't know, there's something, I think, you know, one of the things I oftentimes look for, right, is like, um, and I talk to people about this when they're like looking for you know, careers and stuff is like, you know, finding those niches are, are really useful and finding kind of like, like information or skill arbitrage places, right? Because like, uh, as far as I know, there's not been a ton of, you know, game developers kind of in this bioprinting space so far. And so, you know, I feel like I can bring a lot of value when, you know, I'm sort of bringing this information from, you know, the virtual world. So what particular skills actually, you know, you mentioned a really interesting topic, because this is actually a topic I talk about with other, other uh, my game developer friends. Mm -hmm. But what particular sets of skills that you feel are the most important for you to translate what you knew before to now into 3D printing and bioprinting space? Yeah, so there's a few. So, you know, one of them is just sort of like um, knowledge about uh, like gaming engines, you know, 3D graphics, you know, what is a mesh, how does it work, you know, what are the different ways that we can manipulate it. Um, there's a lot of interesting intuitions that come from game engines because game engines have just had tons and tons and tons of effort thrown at them, right? And so um, that helps both with uh, designing things like editors. I think one of the things that's interesting is if you look at Tissue Workshop, the, and I started laughing eventually because I was like, this is literally just a character creator. Like it's, it's like it's like when you're in a video game and you're trying to customize yeah. like what's your hair color and all that kind of stuff, literally the exact same design principles. And so once I realized that, then it was a lot easier to kind of like go with that because there's a lot of established knowledge on how to build those and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think there's just a lot of kind of design intuitions. There's a lot of knowledge about um, game engines. And then I think the one that's interesting is that uh, there's a bunch of tools that are primarily designed for use in sort of games and VFX industries um, and sort of knowledge of, you know, whatever it is, Maya, Houdini, you know, all yes. those like substance painter, all this kind of stuff, right? Like yep. knowing those particularly, I think can help with this. Um, they're not specifically designed for it, but I think that there's a lot of things that they can do that things like AutoCAD or Fusion 360 just isn't very good at, right? And yeah. I think generative design uh, kind of in the grander sense I think that, that some of those tools have a better better way of approaching that. Um, usually in the CAD sphere, what I've seen so far is that generative design is usually used for very specific things where it's like, we want to lighten this part, or we need to hook this to this with some kind of crazy network in between, right? Uh, but it's not so much, I want to create a part from scratch, just from five data points. You know what I mean? And that's kind of more what we're doing here. Yeah, no, actually, some of the software you mentioned, I never heard of it before until I started to learn about generative design. Mm, and yeah. like you, I'm also a big fan of digital arts, and I discovered quite a few designers in this space. Nice. They're just amazing. Um, actually, as you were speaking, I was thinking I should introduce you to uh, one of the other 3D Heels 2020 speaker, Kevin Yoder. Oh, this great. guy is actually a, a kind of crazy background, computer scientist, gamer, now is a dentist. And he nice. designed his own software for digital dentistry. Um, great. Yeah, we just had him on the webinar. I'd be happy to make intro. Um, and it'd be fun for me because my dad's a dentist also, so. Oh, cool. Well, maybe there's some connection. You know, he doesn't have any social media accounts. He mm -hmm. only has Twitch accounts. <laughs> That's funny. Which I didn't know about before until recently. Um, yeah. Never knew that there is a large platform where people watch other people playing in the virtual space. Mm. Um, so that's something I'm going to check out too. I'm just, you know, growing younger every day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, you look at the average age of a gamer and I think it's, uh, I think it might be older than us. 
these days. But oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It I mean, depends on what you count with social games and mobile games. It's, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's something deeper here, um, but it's still something I'm still processing and, and exploring is the transition between virtual virtual and physical world. I mean, mm -hmm. when, you know, I remember many years ago when I encountered 3D printing, it was shocking because I'm a radiologist. Every day I deal with virtual space images for medical stuff, mm -hmm. right? And suddenly I got this physical piece of heart that looks exactly like the patient's. Um, it's not just like an anatomical model anymore, but the patient's model. Mm -hmm. And that is a shocking experience. And now we can actually kind of freely transition back and forth in the physical and virtual world. I mean, even the VR space that you created, um, there, I mean, there are a lot of medical applications for your mm -hmm. VR as well. I mean, that is almost like a, a desire to be able to transition more freely between these two different spaces. I mean, we're really expanding the world in a way, yeah. in my opinion, which is really fascinating. That gives me goosebumps when you talk about it, because I think that's very real. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the easier it gets to transition things between uh, the physical and the virtual and the virtual and the physical, I think the more that we can get those loops tighter, because there's things that are just way easier to do in the virtual space, but you know, for a lot of things, you just need to end up with a physical space in the end, right? If you're gonna heal somebody, right? And so. Well, that would you know tap into the existential questions about humanity and all that. I mean, is why I have West World in the background. <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. It's not like it's not like we haven't thought about it. Just like technologies evolve and the story would change. You know, what it could do bad yeah. or good can all both happen. Yeah, and that's why those science fiction stories are, you know, so important to kind of give us, you know, cautionary tales on how this stuff can go. I think, you know, one of the things that I, uh, I would hope for a little bit, so I think the cautionary tales are great, right? Because, like, we have all these sort of ethical considerations that we have to think about in these spaces, right? And, you know, we better get started thinking about them now because it's better to think about them before than, than now. Yeah. Um, but I think the other thing that I really uh, want for, and I'm excited when I see people do it, is this sort of, like, positive near future science fiction, right? Like, what does it look like if we've done this well? Because I think, you know, it's something like, okay, we're going to avoid this, but like, where are we shooting, right? And that's where science fiction really comes into play. Yeah. Well, those science fictions usually don't sell. Um, <laughs> but they will be a good product for, for yeah. us to use, nonetheless. Yep. Well, thank you very much, Gavin, for this uh, quick interview with us. And I'm very much looking forward to your presentation at June, in June for uh, 3D Heels 2020. Sounds great.